Hello, welcome to MediTalk. Let us begin today with a good news. The global burden of this pandemic, COVID-19, is rapidly declining. I think this is mainly due to the reduction in number of patients as well as the deaths in the United States and the UK. So that is very encouraging and let us keep hope, but not be complacent. We still need to be cautious. With that, um, we are beginning and uh, today's topic is perhaps the fundamental aspect of medical care in Australia. It is general practice. As I said before, uh, general practitioners, popularly known as the GPs, provide the most uh, important aspect of care. And uh, general practitioners know patients for ages. There is a strong bond between a patient and the GP. And in some areas of the world, it is known as family medicine because it's such a comprehensive care. So today joining us are two general practitioners, Dr. Joy Kuruvila, he is uh, one of the most experienced general practitioner in Melbourne. Uh, Dr. Kuruvila came from India in 1971 and um, he has been practicing in this field for decades. And uh, he was also actively involved in missionary work in India. He graduated from, as I said before, one of the prestigious medical institutions in the world, Christian Medical College, Vellur, Tamil Nadu in India. And he was also a staff director uh, at uh, uh, CMC, Christian Medical College, uh, Vellur. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kuruvila, and we are honored by having you for this uh, program. And Dr. Ruby Jaws, uh, she's a general practitioner. She's joining us from Shepparton. And uh, Ruby uh, graduated from the same institute where I graduated from, Trishur Medical College, Kerala, India. And Ruby is uh, an examiner for Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. And uh, she has been practicing as a general practitioner for more than 10 years now. And Dr. Kurula is practicing at uh, Westcare Medicals in Melton. And um, Dr. Ruby Jaws is practicing at Windham Private in Shepparton. Welcome, Ruby. Hi, Abby. Hi. So let us begin. Is general practice unique in Australia? Is it different from the rest of the world? What can you tell us? General practice in Australia is different compared to many other countries. But in the United Kingdom and the USA, Canada, it's fairly similar. The, the only difference as far as I know is that in UK, uh, a particular doctor is assigned a certain number of patients. And these patients can only go and see their doctor. Whereas in Australia, every person has the freedom to see any GP. Uh, so it's very flexible. It's much more flexible than the U UK system. The US, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's a little bit more complicated because the to see to see the doctor, they need to have health insurance. Right. Otherwise, they have to go to the public system, which I believe is somewhat chaotic. So we are quite fortunate in Australia. Very, very. Yeah. Now, Ruby, um, is the general practice in a regional area like Shepparton different from metropolitan areas? or um, is pretty the same? Uh, I mean, there, is, there are some differences depending on the population group we see uh, compared to in the regional areas, compared to the metropolitan areas, uh -huh. as, you, as you will all understand. Because when we move more to the regional, we see uh, more of people living in the four years, working the like farmers and those group of people. And we do more the role of a family physician than uh, dealing with a particular patient, which we see more in the city. 
um, in the way that as a family physician, you see patients from the uh, like uh, we would have seen the uh, parents, the would have seen the patient, we would have seen you will see their children as well, like just same uh, in the same uh, GP clinic. And uh, also the practices is slightly different as I told you. Like uh, we, our aspects of health concerns may be a bit different. For example, the farmers who have more sun exposure, we deal more with skin skin cancer checks and those kind of necessary uh, screening procedures and things which is needed for that particular group which we deal with. So in that way, a little bit of difference with the metropolitan and um, regional uh, practices. But generally the Generally, the health system is all, all, always the same, like the screening procedures, follow-ups. Right. So, you're seeing a different population. That makes sense. Now, how long do patients have to wait to see a GP in regional areas? Are there a shortage of GPs in these areas? Uh, I, I, cannot, I don't have a statistical data to tell that. but. Many of our patients say that they don't get appointment at the same day with their GP. With their GP, that's what I say. Yeah, that's so good if, actually. Yeah. So, but there is always available GP uh, vacancies in the same clinic. It may not be their own GP, but there will be other uh, GPs who have vacant positions which they can see the same day. That's my understanding. Is. But okay. senior GPs, they have a big population of patients, and they may not be able to get it them the same thing. That's what I understand. Right. Now, Dr. Kurvila, um, do you think um, for immigrant communities, is it difficult yeah. to get a GP here in Australia? Are there any special challenges with immigrant communities here? Yeah, there is. Um, the biggest problem or challenge they face is one language, second cultural background. Yeah. Um, so, they prefer to get a doctor of either their own nationality speaking their language or something more closer. For example, I found that uh, you know, people coming from the Middle East, um, certain parts of uh, uh, Southeast Asia, they prefer to see an Indian doctor or even a Pakistani or Bangladeshi doctors. Because Understandable, yeah. Because they, they seem, they feel that, you know, our cultures are somewhat similar. Other than that, getting access, I don't think there's any issue, but right. uh, this is their problem. And in your practice, I mean, it extended over decades, um, have you seen the GP system in Australia uh, that is different from countries like India, uh, what are those key differences? Okay. Yeah, the main difference is that uh, the general practice is funded by the government, whereas in India, only medical, medical college hospitals, hospitals and district hospitals or primary medical centers are funded by the government. So here, the people have a much greater access and they can choose a particular doctor they may have heard something more about a particular person so they can choose. Right. So the cost, I think, is the major difference. The other difference is that uh, in Australia, the GPs are the first line soldiers. Yeah, everything starts with right. the GP. Unless yeah. you go through the GP, they cannot just go straight to specialists, which I think is a great thing because if you look at, for example, in India, if you have a runny nose, you go to an ENT surgeon. And the end result is that person gets all sorts of investigations done and at the end uh, he wouldn't know clearly how to treat an allergic rhinitis. Whereas here, we do, and plus cost, if everybody was to go to a specialist, imagine the cost that the, uh, the health system would have had. So I think that is a very uh, in a significant difference between here and uh, countries like India. Excellent, excellent point. I think that should be a, an important message for our audience yeah. that uh, general practitioners manage a gamut of conditions and um, uh, it's a very comprehensive care. So is general practice itself a speciality? Uh, the reason I'm asking, although there is a word general, 
um, the general practitioners provide a very holistic care. It's not easy. And um, you have got a Royal Australian College of General Practitioners here and the yep. training yes. is quite lengthy. Uh, it takes five years. Yes. Correct. And um, so uh, is general practice in itself a, a speciality because um, they, it needs a, a lot of skills in managing perhaps every disease. So what would you say about that? Yes, in, it definitely is. In the 70s when I came and went into practice, the, the training program had, uh, hadn't started. There was a college of GPs, but it was uh, had a very limited function. But as time went on, the training program was introduced, the fellowship was introduced. Now, it is accepted as a speciality. Even Medicare expects us to register as specialists. Because if you don't, then yeah. your remuneration is low. And to do that, you have to have your fellowship. And the training program is very rigorous, and by the time somebody comes out of the college, I would say he is a full, or he or she is a fulfilled doctor. It's very good to know. Uh, um, I, yeah. If I may just add, the one good thing is that now in India, this awareness has come. Various universities, the uh, Indian Medical Council, they all have recognized. So to that extent, now Velo has taken a very leading role. We have had two doctors trained with us. They have gone back and started a training program in family medicine an MD program, oh, that's which the universities have accepted and they have been called by various uh, institutions all around India to go and talk to them. So I think they have recognized the, 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 the potential and the need for a family medicine practice. And awesome. it will come yeah. back. I, I think, think it will come into these glorious days as 40 years ago. Uh, I'm sure um, Ruby will agree with uh, this concept of general practice as a, a speciality. Now, Ruby, um, there is a huge uh, surge in the immigrant communities in regional areas. So how do they assimilate the concept of general practice? Uh, because it could be different from their original countries. So, what would you say about that? Uh, definitely. Uh, those people who plan to come to Australia, what my understanding is they have access to the system that is available here and they know a little bit about what's going to happen here and they come prepared. Especially uh, those people who wait for it for some time and come. That includes the refugee population as well as the skilled migrants or whoever migrant population that comes. Yep. Um, so generally when they come, they have some idea about what's going to happen here and what where do they approach. And most of our towns have at least a minimum basic hospital there and they have available GPs around the system. So the natural process, as a natural process, they go through that way. The other thing is about the, uh, the group that comes, like if it is a small young family, then the vaccination systems to be followed and other major health issues, all those. So for that, the Medicare is doing all the support for that. Like for example, they can contact the Medicare to up-to-date their immunization statuses for the children. They can contact their GP to do the rest of that. Medicare, the Australian immunization register will contact them back about what is left back and what they need to uh, complete. So in those, in those aspects, it's very supportive government and the Medicare is doing the, the most of the things too. And we have an uh, interpreter system in the, in the, in the, in the area so that uh, for those coming with difficulty communication problems, uh, we can uh, ask the interpreters to come in and uh, come to the consultation to talk with the patient and that helps as well. Yeah. Excellent. Now, what sort of services are available in regional areas for example is there home-based um, general practice uh, treatment or uh, or 24-hour um, gp clinics in those areas yeah, i told about the interpreter system uh, it's a 24-hour uh, before we need to inform them to get a person to come and help us the other one is we have after hours gps here who work uh, in the uh, after hours like 
after 6 p.m. they work starts and they finish by 12 p.m. So those patients who don't get the, their uh, appointment the same day but uh, need to be seen by a GP but not that emergency to go to the emergency department or the hospital they can contact the Afros GP it's a home based service the Afros GP will visit them at home very convenient and, um, and, and give them uh, medication especially antibiotics or what they can do and refer them for investigations as well and the reports will go to the GP the next day so it's very convenient uh, to uh, Accept those things. Uh, second one is we have uh, here uh, the district nurses service. Who what they do is those patients who have chronic wound care, needing chronic wound care. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, similarly, IV antibiotics, uh, but but doesn't need to get admitted in the hospital. These district nurses visits them at the time of the dose, gives them the antibiotics, monitors them for side effects and improvement. Also, wound care, wound dressing, all those they do at home. Especially, this is very convenient for elderly patients who can't travel much, uh, all those. And um, similarly, we have a hospice service here, hospice, and which is linked with the palliative care. So they are 24 hours working, uh, seven days a week. So they are available on the um, Saturdays and Sundays as well. The nurses visit them at home, supporting the patients who uh, needing palliative care at home. So there's very very. Uh, important uh, services which uh, we connect our patients to. Yeah, it's wonderful to see that such a service is accessible and easily available. Now, what is um, what do you think about the acceptance of modern medicine by or among immigrant communities? Are there uh, a lot of are there uh, is there a lot of resistance in um, uh, accepting uh, modern medicine or the scientific medicine? I haven't noticed that. One one aspect I would say is the government has made the vaccination program for kids mandatory for them to start the kinder as well as school. So the process starts with the if the kids are there, they have to do the vaccination. Otherwise, there is no place for kinder and uh, school. So the, the process starts, and they always uh, have that feeling of coming and talking to the GPs about the need for vaccination, the problems with vaccination, what their uh, difficulties are dealing with and what their um, uh, like concerns are about this process and things like that. I haven't felt anybody uh, having that that kind of a like like uh, not not able to access those because we are always available here. Like uh, yeah. Okay, very good. Now, Dr. Kurivula, um, I think you can tell us about um, the different types of appointments with a general practitioner. Um, what are the levels of appointments? It varies from place to place. For the Medicare requirements, a standard consultation, consultation has to be five minutes to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That is to charge a standard consultation. But I know clinics where they make appointments every six minutes, or sometimes even the no appointment system, people just walk in. Many practices, they book patients every 10 minutes. Uh, an experienced GP can manage most of the common problems in about 10 to 12 minutes. And it's not that at the end of 10 minutes, you ask the patient to move out. You just sometimes, the 10 minutes can sometimes stretch on to 30 minutes. So after 20 minutes, you can charge a long, long consultation. But many practices, book patients every 15 minutes. That's where you feel that uh, you need to spend a little bit more time. Though they come with one problem, there may be other issues that you are aware of or they may bring up. So, and then, so on an average, appointments are made either 10 or 15 minutes. And then sometimes when the patient know that they have things to discuss, they book a 30 minutes long appointment. But that's not to say that we've close at the end of that time. So how about some of the operational aspects of uh, the practice? For example, if a patient is running out of script or after investigation results, how does that work? Right. There are various uh, systems. 
there are some practices where they insist that every patient comes back to discuss their test results. This in some cases it may be a little superfluous because there was nothing to say. The, our practice is that I will tell the patient, we will let you know if there is anything abnormal you will hear from us, otherwise the tests are normal. The only flaw with that is if that result was lost somewhere, it hasn't come to my attention, then the patient never gets told. So there is a bit of a risk in mm. that. Um, so these are the two main ways that uh, we deal with uh, follow-up appointments. If they run out of prescriptions, there again it depends. We have a system where patients, we don't encourage them to ring up for prescriptions, um, but we say make a brief appointment and then just see them because without seeing you tend to rush and you make mistakes yeah. sometimes double up on medications when the patient rings and says i want the green tablet or the, my tablet for the blood pressure they may be on three different blood pressure medications so we tend to discourage that there was one practice i know where patients can ring up for a prescription but they are charged a minimum fee for writing so a doctor will look through all the requests, look at their notes and clarify that everything is okay and then write a prescription. So it's a fine balanced approach. It's a fine balance that you have to. How about your experience, Ruby? To some extent, the system we use allows us to do these things. Like for example, if it is a medical director system, it has got a provision to either discuss or return urgently the results. Discuss will be click and the patient will get a text saying that you please come for the results in two to three weeks time. So that means the results are not an emergency. So we can wait to two, two to three weeks to come and talk, for example, the cholesterol levels or some those kind of uh, results. But those results which need immediate management, like they will be written urgently once. If we click that, the nurses will call them. There will be someone allotted for that. There will be phone call to the patient and make sure they know that they have come in one to two days time. So or on the top, if the doctor thinks that the patient has to be seen the same day, for example, a potassium level going up or low, the patient has to be coming back the same day itself. So in that case, we either directly call the patient or the nurses will call and tell that you please book an appointment today itself. So there's a few different ways of uh, ways we uh, deal with that. Uh, to make sure the patient comes. Sometimes the uh, results, like for example, a pap smear result is the normal one. So we don't advise patient to come and get the normal result. So we say, you do one thing, you check these results when you come either next time or in two weeks time, you will call us and make sure the result has came back and the doctor has seen it. So the doctor, when the doctor sees it, they will be marked seeing no action. So that means they don't have to come back. Come back. So they will confirm that. That's how it works. Now, Dr. Kurvila, the, the, there are many ad advantages for the GP care in Australia, but what are the, some of the challenges you see? That, that's a difficult question, Albi. The challenges, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I started general practice 45 years ago, and the changes that have happened are sometimes challenging for older people like hmm. us. But we evolved with the time. And experience the, of course yes, helps. Yes. yes. The, what I find is that the, the, the patients have become much more demanding. And uh, unfortunately, that close personal relationship with patients are breaking down. And it very sadly, many patients see us as much as money making businessmen. That's unfortunate. And I think, I don't know to what extent we are to blame, but uh, that is the change that I have noticed. Besides that, I can't say there is too many challenges, but I might, I might just add on a little bit to the, you sure, know, yeah. I started my practice in a country town in South Australia, which was a huge farming population. And that was the time, you know, we, there was no after hours services and we used to make house calls. And I have traveled as far as 60 kilometers to make a house call. <laughs> but that was an accepted thing. So you get woken up in the middle of the night and then uh, 
um, and there was again the patients are not just your patients but they are part of your your huge big family uh, in the cities also that used to happen most of the, the gps used to make house calls but then that became quite problematic in many uh, city areas and suburban areas and the countryside also somehow that culture has kind of disappeared okay now there is one more uh, thing that i need to explore with ruby um, when you practice in a regional area yeah. is it too difficult to refer a patient to metropolitan area in case that patient needs extra or specialist care for example in a tertiary center how does that go how do you arrange that the the process is same as even if you are in the metropolitan or in the regional area but the matter of distance to travel is there always for the patient especially for a sick patient there is a bit of difficulty about that but with regard to the referral if you are making a reasonably uh, informative referral letter it will be well triaged and uh, appointment times they get will be uh, reasonable and that's what i felt when you make a referral to melbourne uh, to the higher centers uh, because that's a good thing to do as well like referral letters need to have enough information so that they know the condition of the patient so that they can uh, they get give a, a earliest appointment available after triage if i may just add to that i'll be in the regional areas the gps have to be certainly more skillful and more confident and more astute because if they have an issue they just cannot send every patient to the hospital in the city and suburb the slightest doubt yeah you go to the public hospital just give a letter and send whereas in the uh, regional areas they can't so i have great admiration for people who have taken up practice in the regional areas and they are skillful there you go ruby yes. uh, it is uh, very an uh, inspirational uh, for um, a good proportion of young generation of doctors now dr kurivela for for the gp system uh, other than medicare um, what other supports or uh, any any rebate system from the government or any other supports no i mean as far as the patient is concerned there is no other rebates um, except now the the aged care people they get additional supports but not in the form of medicines but in the form of other home care and such uh, that's my aged care and uh, there is the other chronic disease management programs but as a general no medicare is their only uh, remuneration so uh, sorry to interrupt uh, if a patient uh, has no medicare then what options then to- it's up to the doctor Uh, I mean I've had situations where somebody who is visiting from overseas and so they may not have had a um, job, time to take up a private insurance you just write it off and then of course the medicine they have to pay the full price and uh, this is where the practices uh, there are some practices who would just char bulk bill every patient M- majority of the Uh, practices i guess especially in the country areas in uh, suburban areas they bulk bill the pensioners and children and then use their discretion to bulk bill others but there are city practices and few suburban practices where they don't bulk bill at all and they charge the full fee yeah i think uh, we can tell our audience that um, a general practitioner is very competent to uh, treat a wide variety of medical conditions and uh, patients are in safe hands uh, with uh, the GPs. Uh, Ruby, is there anything else you would like to add? And that is a pleasure of general practice also, I think. Because we don't know anything about what the patient is bringing to you when the patient comes. Okay, so only after the patient comes into the room, we know that what the person is coming for. You have no idea. but that's the pressure of GP general practice as well. He enjoys that. Excellent. And Dr. Kurivela, what would be your final message to our uh, audience? To, to that question you just asked, I would put it this way. We are jacks of all trades, but master of, I wouldn't say none, <laughs> a few. 
Yeah, no, um, as a specialist, personally, uh, I believe uh, GP's role is vital and um, because, as I said before, everything starts with the general practitioner, there's continuity of care, and uh, it is a very uh, critical uh, role in the health system. And thank you, Dr. Kurvila and Ruby for enlightening uh, us and our audience about uh, such a uh, fantastic healthcare system in Australia. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Albi, for having yes. us.